Good morning. Welcome to the webinar on uh, Towards Autonomous Driving on Road, the EGNSS contribution. This is Gabriella Power speaking. I will moderate this webinar while my colleagues Gianluca Marucco and Matteo Annucchi are this morning's speakers. This webinar is organized uh, in, uh, within the Jupiter project. Uh, Jupiter is funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 Framework Research Program in the Galileo Core. This call is managed by the European Genesis Agency, GSA. Jupiter is coordinated by Aerospace Valley. This morning, uh, we will talk about uh, GNSS as enabling technology for the autonomous driving. Of course, GNSS is not alone. There are many, many technologies involved in autonomous driving. You can see, for example, vehicle electronics, vehicle dynamics, command and control items, human to machine interface, and so on, computer vision, perception, data fusion, communication technologies, echo driving. But uh, there are so many, but uh, the final project uh, is not supposed to be a rover moving on Mars or on the moon. So this is uh, why we will need all these uh, technologies, because we need the final product able to move in a crowded environment where there are pedestrians and also other uh, actors of the road and where centimeters can make really the difference for the security, for the safety, sorry. So many technologies, but GNSS is fundamental. So we have also navigation, and uh, GNSS is fundamental for uh, different aspects, for routing, because uh, routing can be decided using digital maps. Uh, navigation can also be used to determine the uh, vehicle location and speed or the lane and attitude determination. Another important aspect is the short range situation awareness system, so the awareness of other vehicles in the road and collision avoidance. And this can be done in combination with positional information sharing among cars. So today we will start with uh, uh, an outlook on uh, how Genesis works. So some genesis principle, then uh, we will talk about the European satellite systems, both EGLOS and Galileo, and then we will focus on a very specific feature that is fundamental to achieve a reliable autonomous driving integrity. So let's start our travel together today. I leave uh, the floor to Gianluca Marucco who will uh, uh, guide us in the GNSS world. Gianluca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriella. This morning I will talk to you about some principles concerning GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System. The main purpose of GNSS is to enable users to determine their position with respect to a reference frame. The basic principle on which GNSS are based is trilateration. Here I will provide you an example based on a bidimensional bi case. There are transmitter in known position and a receiver in an unknown position. The particularity of this receiver is to be able to measure a time of arrival and consequentially the distances. We know that the receiver is at a certain distance from the antenna, the transmitting antenna. So we can say that the receiver is placed on a circumference which center is the antenna, the transmitting antenna. But we don't know where the receiver is exactly. The same we can say for a second transmitter and for a third transmitter 
at this, this point we can say that the receiver is where the three uh, circumference met a single point. The time of arrival is measured by the receiver. The, rece the time of departure is no because it is set by the transmitter. The travel time is the difference of these two times. The distance is the travel time multiplied by the speed of light. So transmitter and receiver must be equipped with clocks. The time difference between transmitter and receiver is the basis. So the transmitter and the receiver clocks must be synchronized and this is a very onerous requirement because if you think that a synchronization error of one microsecond correspond to an error distance of approximately 300 meters. Now let's talk about trilateration by satellites. So we talk about a three-dimensional system. There are transmitters that are on board satellites. Satellites are at known position because we know the orbits and the satellite time. The satellites are equipped with atomic clocks so they have a precise reference in time while the users is an unknown position on the surface of the Earth or in the space. So a global navigation satellite system consists of a constellation of satellites with global coverage whose payloads are designed to provide, to provide the positioning of the objects. GNSS implement the trilateration method, that is a spherical positioning systems. The satellites are at no position, as we know satellites orbits and time. In order to know the precise location of the satellites, we need a reference coordinate system and frames while for the time we need time scales. This is a graphical representation of a three-dimensional positioning. We have the Earth, a first satellite. We measure a distance so we know that the receiver is on the surface of this sphere a second satellite and a second sphere. This, these two spheres intersect in a circumference. If we consider a third satellite, we will see that the, for, the um, third sphere intersect the circumference in two points. And we can choose one of these two points based on the presence of the receiver on the Earth's surface. So we can choose this point. So three distance measurement in this example appear to be enough for a, for a positioning system in a three-dimensional space. But uh, so it's, it seems that three satellites are enough but in reality, four satellites are needed. Why? This is to sidestep the so-called synchronization requirement. Let's see what this synchronization requirement is. So, a receiver are equipped with inexpensive quartz oscillator. Atomic clock are just on board the satellites. So the, the time of arrival measurement at the receiver side are affected by the so-called clock bias. Every measurement is affected by the same clock bias because 
in the receiver where refer the reference um, time is provided by a single clock. This clock bias can be tra um, transformed in a range bias, that is the fourth unknown, that is the clock bias multiplied by the speed of light. So we talk about, uh, when we talk about mm, distance measured performed by a receiver, we talk about pseudo range instead of ranges because of this clock bias. So in order to estimate its position, a receiver must have at least four satellites in view. The, the satellite must be line of sight. If a larger number of satellites is in view, a better estimation is possible. In the past, the combination, a combination of four satellites given the best performance was chosen, but now with the evolution of a receiver, it is possible to track a lot of satellites and so to perform a better estimation of the position using a lot of satellite at the same time. So let's go deeper talking about receivers. So the task of the receiver is not simple at all because, okay, it's the matter of receiving satellites, signal from satellites, but there are some errors also in the clock, the atomic clock of the satellites, and also error in the position of the satellites because ephemeris that describe the orbits of the satellites can contain some errors. Then the receiver must take into account the Doppler effect because of the satellite's motion. Other impairments are the attenuation of the signal along its path. For example, trees can low the signal uh, to noise ratio. Also atmospheric error are present due to ionosphere and troposphere. Multipath in another, is another source of error. The path of the signal is longer than the direct path. Then another problem is interference and jamming due, due to other sources of electromagnetic signals. Urban Canyon are another problem because they can shield the signal and uh, avoid uh, their reception from the receiver. Another problem is indoor. Indoor, it is very difficult to receive uh, satellites coming from, uh, from satellites indoor. Talking about multipath, I can show you this simulator that was developed by a partner of the Jupiter project. And you can see how in a simulated environment a lot of signal are received from the antenna placed in this case of a, on a tram and you can see that direct paths that are represented by um, white lines sums with red lines that represent reflected signal. In this, within this simulator we can also simulate diffracted signal enabling the the particular feature from the panel. So now we are, you are going to see also diffracted signal from a lot of surfaces of the model that are represented by blue lines. So in reality the number of the signals that a receiver uh, receives and which can impair the 
correct estimation of the distance are a large number. So now let's talk about the receiver chain. And let us consider the, uh, the signal in space of a single space vehicle, so a single satellite. So this is the signal, this is a radio frequency antenna and the front end, that is a radio frequency hardware that enable the signal to be received and post-processed. The radio frequency signal is then converted from analog to digital and pass to the G digital part of the receiver that provides at the end the pseudo range that is the distance measure. So among the uh, operation that a receiver must perform before computing the final position, the first is the sky search. So the receiver must search for the visible satellites through their IDs. Once a list of searchable satellite is complete, now the receiver must acquire the single signal coming from the satellites. So code delay and Doppler estimates and rough alignment of the code and carrier must be performed by the receiver. During the tracking phase, the, the code and carrier alignment are refined. Once the signal is tracked and locked, measurement, distance measurement, and data demodulation can be performed. After this phase, through the position of the satellites and the pseudo-range measurement, the computation of the so-called position, velocity, and time can be performed. The, the sixth stage is the integration with external information. So it, we talk about augmentation, improvement of positioning, but this is an optional feature. It is not present in our receiver. And also the human-machine interface can be considered as an optional for uh, some receivers. If uh, we have to talk about performance, we can distinguish among receiver classes. And uh, also, I will provide you some receiver specification that will help you in distinguish among different receivers. So the first class of receiver are the NL receiver for Iker, Ikers and Sailors. These are small and they can uh, display latitude, longitude and maps and the price is generally from 100 to 600 euros. Now low-cost single frequency receiver are integrated in mobile phones and their cost depend also on the feature of the mobile phone. Maritime navigators have large displays with electronic charts and let's say are more professional from this point, from the human machine interface point of view. Also uh, in car navigation system as a variety of price and interface that, uh, that are justification for these variations of price. So the price difference are in some reason, in some way independent from the embedded GNSS chipset. Uh, aviation receiver 
are maybe simpler for the some point of view for example they are single frequency but they had they have stringent requirement for example for integrity and so this is the reason why the, their price is higher than 3000 euros among survey and mapping professional receiver there is a wide range of kind because we can go from a single frequency to multiple frequency receiver, single constellation, multiple multiple constellation, and accuracy can range from one meter to some few centimeters. Then we we have also GNSS module that are not complete receiver. Uh, we have plug-in modules that integrate receiver and antenna in the same package. We have uh, original equipment manufacturer board that need to be integrated in a uh, complex system. And also the, the simple part are chipsets that which price ranges from $1 or one euro to 30 euros. It depends on the level of integration that is originally provided by the producer. Uh, which are the differences between the so-called mass market receiver and professional ones? It's not just a matter of ability of produce carrier phase and code phase measurement. is also the ability of produce raw measurement instead of just position is a matter of configurability of the receiver at different level. We, we range from receiver that are able to provide just your position and the receiver in which we can control the tracking loop bandwidth and other features that are very uh, low level. So among the category we can distinguish among uh, consumer, light professional, professional, safety of life, public regulated service receiver, and for each receiver we add uh, a group of specific characteristics. You can read all these characteristics for each category of receiver. So the main GNSS receiver feature that uh, enable uh, you to distinguish among different types are the number of and kind of constellation exploited, the mm, characteristic of being military, so able to decode also encrypted military signal or just civil signal. Another feature is the PVT update rate. Usually is one second, but some kind of receiver can reach 100 Hertz as a PVT rate. Then some receiver support some indoor operation and uh, can resist to high multipath environment. Some receiver has uh, some feature for mitigating interferences. Some receiver are able to work in high dynamic while other are specific for static application. The capability of exploiting a differential or augmentation system like EGNOS or simply DGPS differentiate some receiver from the others. Uh, the ability of uh, storage and log data, the shock and vibration tolerance, the cartographic support, the integration with inertial integration uh, system or dead breaking system so the ability of 
providing output to the position also when the signal are not no more received like in tunnels uh, other feature are the integration with the communication system the portability the usability power consumption and of course cost so here I want to provide you uh, an example of technical specification of two professional receiver. One is the Septentrio Polar RX4 Pro that has uh, 264 hardware channels. So it is able to track 264 different signal at once. Track Plus is a septentrio uh, patent low nose tracking algorithm. Then uh, the receiver is able to receive uh, GPS L1, L2, L2C, and L5 signal, GLONASS on the two frequencies, Galileo A1, uh, E1, E5A, E5B. E5 alt box and also GLONASS CDMA on uh, the L3 frequency. It is able also to track in uh, Beidou signals and has a specific uh, uh, algorithm uh, for uh, the interference monitoring mitigation, multipath estimation, and so on. These are uh, some uh, example of technical specification concerning uh, pseudo range measurement performance. So depending on the, uh, the signal, the receiver can achieve different performance in the measurement of uh, distances based on, on the code reception. In this case, it's code reception in this case is measurement based on carrier phase tracking. So you see that with carrier phase, the, uh, that is more uh, difficult to have a, a stable measurement with the carrier phase, but the, per the measure, the, the performance are much better with respect to code measurement. So this is a similar technical specification for a Novatel uh, 6 to 8 receiver. So with a lot of hardware channel, again, different uh, system, including the Japanese QSS, uh, and specific algorithm for RTK, multipath mitigation, and integration with inertial sensors. And these are the performance for pseudo range and carrier phase that are pretty similar to the uh, Septentrio ones. For Novatel, we have also position accuracy that uh, is uh, different from uh, the accuracy achievable with. Uh, the accuracy refer to pseudo range because in this case we have also to account errors coming from ephemeris and clock bar meters. We had also uh, specification about data rate and vibration. So these uh, slides comes from the GNSS market report of GSA, the uh, GNSS European Authority. So we can say that all the receiver are capable of receive, receive, receiving GPS, but also if more than 30% are already able to receive Galileo. And these are graphs tells us how many receiver in percentage, how many uh, receiver intended not are the global market share, but the number of products 
are able to receive just GPS, two constellation, uh, three constellation, or all four constellation already uh, transmitted, transmitting GPS, GLONASS, Beidou, and Galileo. And talking about uh, Galileo and also about uh, uh, receiver performance, uh, here in uh, this graph we can see an experiment that uh, we performed in mid-2014 uh, when just three Galileo satellites were uh, transmitting a valid navigation message. So a valid navigation message, of course, is necessary in order to compute uh, a valid position. So at the time uh, with a specific uh, software receiver, we uh, were able to uh, track and decode messages from Galileo satellites and GPS satellites. So we uh, performed a PVT computation using five GPS satellites and the result is plot in blue. <clears throat> then we used three Gal the three Galileo satellite available at the time plus two GPS satellites. And we choose uh, the two GPS satellites in addition to the Galileo one in order to have a similar condition for the two different set of satellites, the five GPS satellites and the three Galileo plus two GPS satellites in order to make a fair comparison for the two systems. And here we see that from the precision point of view, the, the Galileo is performing very well because the position has, are less scattered with respect to, to Galileo. So uh, now I leave the floor to, to Matteo uh, in order to talk you about uh, uh, European GNSS. Thank you. Thank you Gianluca for this introduction uh, to the GNSS world and uh, to the hints you gave on uh, the GNSS receivers. Uh, there have been some questions in the meanwhile, uh, so I'll try to answer them. Um, I hope all of you have, uh, can listen to us because uh, there is one person that had problems with this audio. And uh, then uh, there is a question about a question about the slides. So yes, uh, we will send you the slides that has been used for this uh, webinar, and you will also be able to download them from the Jupyter website. So we can now go on and uh, step into the European contribution to satellite systems. Uh, so uh, my colleague Matteo Vannucchi will introduce us in this world. Good morning, everybody. First of all, why do we need uh, the augmentation system? What, what are the purposes? An augmentation system has the general objective of improving the use of GNSS through the provision of additional information to the final user. We can use the augmentation systems in many different fields. For example, uh, for the systems that keep the focus on the accuracy, like the location-based services in general, including even laser application for mapping, cadastral, surveying. Then we have all the systems for safety, safety of life applications, like air navigation, water navigation, and transportation in general. Finally, we have the systems for uh, use for legal or liability applications like road tolling and the uh, 
economic exploitation zone applications. Uh, these uh, kind of applications are very important, for example, for fisheries or for the control of the boundaries. ECNOS is the European Augmentation System. Its main purpose uh, at the beginning was to enable the aircraft to use the GPS for all the phases of flight, from the en route down to the precision approaches to the airport within the EGNOS coverage area. Today, uh, EGNOS uh, improves the use of GPS. In the future, it will improve even the use of uh, Galileo and maybe of other uh, global navigation satellite system. EGNOS was promoted by Eurocontrol, the European Community, and the European Space Agency. EGNOS has two main features the provision of a wide area differential corrections and the integrity information. Today, EGNOS uh, provides three main services, safety of life, open services, and uh, EDAS, the EGNOS data access service. Here uh, we have a, a slide representing an orthophoto displaying a walk uh, we took uh, on the mountains uh, around Torino. As you can see, we have a, a blue track and a red track. The blue track is the track without uh, uh, correction, while the red track display a GPS corrected by EGNOS. As you can see, uh, in many cases, like in this one, we are not uh, uh, able to uh, provide an EGNOS correction for many reasons. For example, in this case, uh, we were under a mountain, so uh, we were not able to see the satellites. Then we have many other uh, possibilities like uh, urban canyons or uh, other problems. This is the reason why uh, we need EDAS. EGNOS Data Access Service. So now EGNOS uh, is providing a terrestrial commercial data service called EDAS. EDAS offers a ground-based access to EGNOS data. We can say that EDAS is the single point of access for all the data collected and generated by the EGNOS, EGNOS infrastructure. EDAS provides uh, uh, three main types of data. GPS, GLONASS, and EGNOS geodata collected by the entire EGNOS stations network. Then the EGNOS augmentation messages identical to those broadcasted via uh, gestationary satellites. And finally, the antenna phase center coordinates for each EGNOS reference station. EDAS has two main purposes. EDAS was designed to deliver EGNOS data to all the user, users that are not uh, able to see uh, directly the EGNOS satellites. As we said before, uh, for example, is not possible in uh, urban canyons or uh, near uh, mountains and so on. Indeed, EDAS was designed to support a variety of other services like uh, uh, research uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, scientific research, uh, advanced location-based services, and so on. The European Space Agency uh, will maintain uh, the EDAS service over the long term. EDAS can be used for many uh, applications. For example, uh, it can be used uh, for uh, user communities uh, in urban canyons. Uh, and in this case, uh, it's important the redistribution of the EGNOS augmentation messages. Then we have all the applications uh, using the uh, assisted GNSS, in particular for location-based services. 
uh, like for example uh, mobile network operators that uh, need to provide position assistance uh, uh, to their customers or um, as we said uh, before location based services in urban areas uh, where we have urban canyons and so on or for example all the emergency services using the positioning information uh, through mobile phones or cars then we have all the uh, professional uh, GNSS services such for example uh, surveying oil and gas exploration mapping construction and so on another branch of application very interesting is the uh, differential GNSS applications and the uh, uh, real-time kinematic positioning techniques. Um, these applications are very interesting, in particular in the areas close to the EGNO stations, uh, where we can boost the precision. Indeed, uh, it's very important the uh, EGNOS messages uh, broadcasted through the CISNET from, for uh, mobile receivers uh, with internet access in this uh, in this case, uh, all the uh, CISNET uh, uh, receivers can receive the EGNOS data even if the uh, EGNOS satellites are, uh, or GPS satellites are not in view. Then, as we said before, EDAS was designed even for uh, research initiatives and uh, research activities. In particular, can be used for the uh, to study uh, the uh, atmosphere uh, behavior and finally uh, can be uh, EDAS can be used for offline and real-time processing uh, for uh, GNSS performance analysis here uh, we can see uh, the EDAS architecture EDAS services are uh, classified uh, in the following way we have the main data stream services that deliver raw data using the service, service level 0 and the service level 2. Then we have the data filtering service that allows all the EDAS users to access a subset of the service level 0 and the service level 2 uh, in order to reduce the uh, bandwidth consumption. Then we have the FTP service that enables EDAS user to get all the EDAS EGNOS historical data in different formats and data rates in order to uh, do some post-processing post techniques. Then we have the CISNET service that provides access to the EGNOS Geo satellites messages message over the internet using the CISNET protocol. The CISNET protocol was defined by the European Space Agency in 2002. Finally, we have the NTRIP service. The NTRIP service provides data from the EGNOS network through the NTRIP protocol, which represents the standard for the uh, differential GNSS correction distribution. So, uh, we can say that EGNOS and EDAS uh, provides a great added value for ITS application. In fact, improved accuracy and in particular integrity information are very important for uh, some ITS application like for example the e-call for the automatic emergency call for uh, all the uh, dangerous uh, goods transportation and uh, for the advanced driver assistance systems um, and all these uh, uh, applications will use EGNOS and EDAS even more in the future. Thank you Matteo for, uh, for this introduction to the to EGNOS which was the first contribution of the European Union the world of satellite navigation. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can write them in the proper field and we will answer them 
uh, at the end of the next presentation, which is uh, again from Matteo on uh, the Galileo system. Please, Matteo, the floor is yours. So, let's talk about Galileo. As you probably know, Galileo is an initiative of the European Union and of the European Space Agency in collaboration with European industries. Galileo is a civilian system under civilian control. Galileo was designed to offer more and new advanced services. Uh, Galileo is independent from GPS but is compatible and interoperable with it. So uh, here we, we, we see some Galileo add-on. For example, Galileo is designed to offer an advanced precision and this is uh, due to the new modulation schemes of the signals. Then uh, Galileo will provide a better availability and a better coverage and this is uh, due to the specific orbit design of the constellation. Galileo will offer, using the uh, commercial service, a better reliability and a better accuracy, accuracy for selected users. We see uh, now in this slide the uh, Galileo implementation plan. Uh, Galileo uh, started its uh, development uh, at the beginning of this century and should be uh, fully uh, operational by 2020. The uh, system should have 30 satellites and uh, will have a global coverage. So, now a, a short definition of uh, GNSS signal authentication. Authentication is the certification that a received signal is not counterfeit that it originates from a GNSS satellite and not from a spoofer. So we can say that the uh, presence of a, a cryptographically secure portion in the received GNSS signal is required. And we can call it security code or digital signature. But why do we need authentication? Today, the demand of high-quality location-based services is increasing. And this is due because these location-based services need high accuracy and reliable position and time information. GNSS today is used, and it will be used even more in the future, for liability-critical applications and commercial-sensitive location-based services, such, for example, uh, road user charging, uh, page drive insurances, mobile pay payments, and so on. In these cases, the information about the user's position or user's velocity is the basis for legal decisions or economic transactions, so it's very important. Indeed, surveillance and safety critical uh, application and system today and even more in the future, rely on GNSS. For example, we have uh, dangerous goods, transportations, uh, law enforcement, and some other application. So we can say that the risk uh, of an intentional alteration of the GNSS signals by means of jamming, meconing, or spoofing attacks, uh, it's real, and these attacks uh, are usually made for frauds, illicit exploitation, or offense purposes, both by hackers or terrorists. So, uh, one of the main countermeasures can be possibly based, based on cryptographically secure signals. And now uh, we see a video dedicated to a spoofing attack detection with the Galileo authentication signal. Uh, this video uh, was made for uh, the Jupiter project. Jupiter means Joint European Project for International ITS EGNSS Awareness Raising. It is a, a, and it is an H2020 project managed by uh, the GSA. This video presents a spoofing attack detection exploiting the Galileo signal authentication. 
and uh, was presented at the uh, ITS World Conference 2015 in Bordeaux. In this case, Galileo GPS and Agnos Singlans are used for uh, positioning. In green, you will see the real path, while in red, the spoofing uh, attack uh, with a counterfeit log. As we uh, know, uh, spoofing is becoming a real threat for many ITS uh, applications, like for example, uh, autonomous driving. Fraudulent users uh, could fool the onboard positioning system, generating false uh, GNSS signals, as we can see uh, from the video. We can say that payment and liability critical applications are vulnerable to those uh, uh, spoofing attacks. Here we can see our uh, setup. We have an RF recorder, a rubitium oscillator, and a signal generator. And here, our test bench. We have our software receiver, Engine 2, and a commercial GPS receiver. First case, we have a commercial GPS receiver under attack. As we can see from the video, real and counterfeit signals have been independently, independently generated and then combined. At this point, we fed the commercial GPS receiver with the combined signal. But, as you can see uh, from the video, the commercial receiver tracks the spoofed signal and locks the full path without any clue about the attack. And now, let's see what happens using our Engine Genesis software receiver. Our receiver uh, is able to receive GPS, EGNOS, and Galileo signals from all the satellites in view. As you can see from the uh, video, uh, it exploits uh, the digital signature in the navigation message to authenticate the Galileo signals. In fact, the Galileo signals are authenticated and are in green. Only the Galileo signals are used for a trustable positioning solution. In this case, as you can see uh, from the left side of the screen, the PVT is authenticated. Now the counterfeit log is detected and uh, the two tracks overlap for a while. Now our software receiver uh, demonstrates that the uh, positioning solution is no more authenticated. In fact, the uh, all the signals, GPS and Galileo signals, are now in red, and on the left side, you can see that PVT is not authentication. As you can see, multi-correlators are one of the advanced features of our uh, software receivers. receiver. Okay. So, let's talk about the uh, Galileo services. Galileo will offer many services. Uh, probably the most famous one is the open service that will be freely accessible for uh, positioning, navigation, and timing uh, worldwide. Then we have the uh, public regulated service that will be an encrypted service designed for uh, to be uh, very robust and with a high availability, uh, for example, for civil, civilian protection and so on. Then we will have the uh, search and rescue service and uh, finally the commercial service. The commercial service will deliver authentication and high accuracy uh, services for uh, commercial applications. Uh, the former safety of life service uh, is being reprofiled and now it's called the uh, integrity monitoring service and it will provide uh, vital integrity information for life critical applications like for example for flights. Here um, we can say that high accuracy and authentication are the main services foreseen to be part of the commercial service. 
Authentication for commercial service can be based both on spreading code encryption and navigation message authentication. So, uh, two level of our levels of authentication would be possible. Uh, the first one, a database authentication service in the E1 open signal for mass market users. And the second one, a database plus spreading code authentication service through the commercial service signals. Here we have some of the uh, authentication target application in the road domain. We will have all the road user charging application, the digital tachograph applications, and then the world of the logistics with, for example, freight transportation, fleet management, and similar application. Finally, we will have, especially in the next future, uh, all the pay-as-you-drive application, uh, also known as pay-per-use uh, insurance or pay-per-use uh, applications. So, finally, we can say that uh, the term reliability is used to refer to integrity and authentication together. It means uh, the availability of a trusted PVT that, as we said before, can be used for uh, liability critical and safety critical application. What is the level of uh, maturity of these two uh, features? As we said, uh, authentication protects against false signals that can be generated intentionally. We can say that once implemented, an authentication service offers a guarantee that still depends on the level of the attack. Integrity uh, today has been validated only for some applications like aviation. For other application fields, uh, research is still undergoing, especially because we have to take into account local effects that can't be easily modeled. And we are talking especially of uh, regarding multipath. Thank you, Matteo. So we got uh, some questions in the meanwhile, so we will try to answer them before going to the last point, uh, which is the core of this uh, webinar on the integrity concept. So um, first of all, uh, one question uh, asks about the a timeline of when Galileo services will be available, in particular the commercial service and the public regulated services. Well, to my knowledge, uh, the open service uh, is supposed to be available at least in Europe uh, in 2018. Uh, for the PRS, uh, I don't know, I'm not supposed to know these uh, secured information. While for what concerns the commercial service, they are working on the definition. We still do not have uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the the document the the document with the description of the service. So we hope to have it as soon as possible. Then we have other questions. I will ask uh, Gianluca to help me answering. So the first one, which is the difference with, between uh, precision and accuracy. So Gianluca, please. Okay. So. Um... Precisions, uh, preci precision refer to, if you imagine, a series of positions represented by uh, some points. Uh, precision refers to how these points are gathered together. So how close these points are one to the others. While accuracy is how close the average of the position of a cloud of point is close to the truth. Concerning the, the slides uh, talking about uh, the, the feature of Galileo, uh, we can say that precision, so how close the points are to each other, is due mainly uh, to the new modulation that have a better rejection of multipath, that is a phenomenon that 
makes the point to scatter around, while accuracy is improved by uh, differential correction, for example, as those provided by the commercial, that will be provided by the commercial service, because they correct for effects like uh, um, not, not accurate ephemeris or uh, ionospheric delay that cause uh, the points to get uh, far from the, the, the truth. Thank you. I uh, hope this answers the questions. Then we have an additional question um, for, um, for you. In the, the software receiver, the, the NAPSA software receiver we showed in the, in the video, uh, they ask uh, for the uh, multi-correlators uh, and uh, they are asking what uh, the, these multi-correlators are for. So in general, generally speaking, the multi-correlator feature uh, serves for um, a, a lot of give a lot of possibility. For example, uh, to implement with the outputs of this correlator uh, algorithm for multipath rejection. In the particular case of uh, um, detection of and mitigation of a spoofing attack the multi-correlator enable you to see um, the form of the autocorrelation function of the signal and in case two different signals, the real one and the spoofer, are present, it is possible to see um, the presence of these two signals and so together with uh, the authentication me mechanism that was uh, described uh, enable to see the two different signals and uh, uh, not just doing uh, uh, detection of the attack but also mitigation. This is not so simple as for the detection but uh, uh, some strategy can be thought uh, using multi-correlator feature. Thank you Gianluca. Um... I think uh, we have still one question uh, about, again, authentication. The question is, is authentication linked to PRS, so the public regulated service? Uh, of course, yes. The PRS is authenticated because uh, PRS uh, will be a, a totally encrypted uh, signal. So the fact that the signal is encrypted, it means that Nobody can generate this uh, signal except that uh, in very sophisticated uh, spoofing attack, but in any case the signal is authenticated because it is generated in a way that is not known. And, and so the, the user that is uh, as the, the, the key for the code, this kind of signal, is, will be uh, certain of his uh, uh, provenience, while uh, on the commercial service uh, is likely to implement other kind of authentication that are lighter, uh, so in, in, like inserting signature within the navigation message, but the message can be read without any, and applying any cryptographically decoding feature. It's just a matter of if you, uh, someone want to exploit the authentication feature, it's just a matter of reading the signature. Okay, thank you. And of course, all the GMSS uh, community is waiting uh, for the uh, document uh, describing the, this uh, new, uh, new service. So, uh, we can now proceed with uh, our uh, webinar going to the last point, uh, which is the integrity. I leave the floor to Gianluca again uh, to talk about this uh, topic. Now let's deal with integrity, and in particular integrity referred to the road domain. So first of all, let's give uh, two definitions. One, the formal one, is uh, 
the definition that uh, says that integrity is the ability of the system to provide timely warning to users when it may the system not be used to navigate while the informal one given by the father of GPS that is Dr. Brad Parkinson I know I'm getting this accuracy the system is not lying to me so I can trust the navigation system first we will discuss the need for a novel definition of the concept of GNSS integrity in the road domain second we will introduce the concept of local integrity we will review the reference system architecture and the method proposed to cooperatively, cooperatively estimate the local GNSS degradations. And third, we will discuss the experimental setup used to build and validate the proof of concept in a urban scenario. And finally, we will present the prototype demonstrator developed by ISMB and we will see a short video showing its operations. So this is the classic aviation-borne integrity appro approach. It was uh, mainly defined in the aviation context for strictly, strictly safety of life application and the integrity information is provided by augmentation system like SBUS or LAS via protection levels. The growing interest in other transportation fields like the maritime, the rail, and in particular vehicular transportation uh, made emerge the need for a reliable, meaning as we saw before, integer and possible, possibly certified positioning information that is important in the case of safety critical or liability critical applications. So the applicability of the aeronautical classic integrity concept is far from being straightforward in aviation in case that are different from the aviation one. So a, a deep reconsideration of this concept is need and in particular as we are going to see in urban context. If we put the question is it possible to adopt the classic integrity mechanism developed in the civil aviation field for road application? We believe the answer is no, it isn't. And the reason for this answer are several. Typical requirement or specification, namely the integrity risk and the continuity risk associated to the flight operation are too conservative for non-safety of flight vehicular application. This would lead to too conservative protection levels and to unavailability of the service. Integrity and continuity risk are assigned per phase of flight, but these phases do not match with any behavior of a car on the road. The conventional aeronautical GNSS signal models may be no more consistent in a terrestrial vehicular scenario because they assume open sky satellite visibility and diffuse ground multipath only. The probability of the presence of non-line of sight propagation is considered negligible. Furthermore, they often assume the availability of local cor differential correction to get rid of ionospheric delay. The third reason is essentially due to the effect of the receiver itself and of the local propagation nearby the receiver, which in particular urban scenario is dominated by asymmetric and limited satellite visibility, heavy multipath or 
non-line of sight propagation and autonomous single frequency ionospheric corrections. Among all, this is the aspect we focus on today. Let's review now the concept of local integrity. So the concept of local integrity we address here is a methodology to quantify or estimate in average the effect of the local environment nearby the receiver and it is especially designed for the road domain. It is intended to overcome the difficulty in modeling the local environment we mentioned before and it is related to the classic uh, so, with respect to the, the classic aeronautical integrity. It is worth mentioning that uh, this concept has been proposed and developed in the framework of the uh, European F Framework Program 7 GLOVE project. So, the uh, ingredients of this methodology are cars equipped with uh, mass market receivers and used as sensor for signal quality assessment. GNSS observations taken on board of the car are shared via Baynet vehicular area networks uh, and in this way it is possible to implement a collaborative monitoring of GNSS signals in urban scenarios by means of special and temporal characterization of the GNSS signals degradation due to the local effects. In this way, it's possible to recompute the classic protection levels on the basis of this ensemble monitoring of the quality of the received signals in a given area and time. These protection levels will be ellipses around the true position with axis oriented along the direction of the road, along track or in the orthogonal direction, cross track. The reference architecture to implement the collaborative signal quality monitoring can be understood from this figure. First, we consider a set of many cars measuring their GNSS observable in certain instant. Second, their observable are sent to a central processing facility via Vanet Communications. The central processing facility uses this observable to build and update a database. That is a special and temporal digital map of the GNSS signal quality expected in certain areas as certain times so that the receiver on the fields can compute their protection levels. At the same time, the central processing facility communicates the predicted quality of the GNSS measurement to the cars through the Vanet again. Now let's try to be more operative. How does the signal quality information coming from the central processing affect the protection level computation? Let's recall the classic definition of protection level. It contains a factor depending on the current geometry between the receiver and the satellite, a factor related to the quality of the pseudo range measurement and a factor necessary to meet the integrity risk requirement. Using the collaborative local quality monitoring, we define a new error model, which is able to take into account local GNSS signal degradations. This new effective user equivalent range error 
is what we obtain as an ensemble estimation computed for each satellite in view, in each position of a grid in a map at each hour of the day. The measurement of the local GNSS signal sorry, degradations is obtained by monitoring the so-called pseudorange residuals defined as the difference between the measured pseudorange and the estimate ones. On the basis of the satellites and the receiver position, the pseudorange residuals are typically observable used in RAIM technique and are provided by almost all GNSS receivers via an appropriate NMIA sentence. From the covariance of the pseudorange receiver residual obtained via an approximate ensemble estimate, we obtain an estimate of the effective user equivalent range error. At this point, we have to validate this theoretical model with measurement and test in order to pro prove our concept. The theoretical model was experimentally evaluated through a campaign of urban measurement followed by extensive post-processing analysis. Multiple vehicular tests were done in consecutive days at approxim approximately the same hour using various receivers. The reference urban path was ca characterized by a three-line avenue, a wider avenue with a complicated pole structure, and two narrow streets with uh, five, six-story bricks building. First, we verified in post-processing the repeatability of the pseudorange residual observation taken along the same path along several days and for eight satellites in view. A second fundamental verification done in post-processing is the correlation in space and time of the measured residual. Range residual resulted to be highly correlated within about every 15 meters and within about five minutes in the same position. This allows us to build a grid on the digital map where for each cell of the grid, the average residual for each satellite in view are stored. The grid has 15 meters spatial resolution and 5 minutes temporal resolution. This is what is shown by the blue lines on this map. For each cell along the path, the associated effective UERE can be computed. And now it's time to see the implementation of this concept on a prototype demonstrator. The demonstrator we have implemented is essentially a software module implemented on a car PC mounted on board of a car. We imagine to have one uh, such processor on each car of the vanet. The local integrity module passes and processes live GNSS measurement from a commercial GPS signal receiver through NMIA protocol ready to be sent to the central facility. Compute the local protection level using the range residual database along the reference path and finally shows local protection levels in real time on a graphical user interface on board. And this is the video showing the car along the path with the local protection level this vary in times and at the same time we can see pseudo range residual and the sky plot of the available GNSS satellite in view. Just to give an example of the result obtained during a live test, you can see here the time evolution of the computed protection level, as well as some statistics, namely the maximum value and the estimated uh, 90 
5% uh, quantile. The local integrity represents a promising concept for the domain of the connected vehicles, but deeper investigation is needed. Further research efforts are needed in order to refine the statistical characterization of the different error sources, including the detection of non-nominal errors. It is necessary to properly calibrate the database building procedure to different application and situation areas in terms of space and time resolution. Beside an extensive campaign of validation of the database of the database should be planned. In addition, a proper definition and design of the data communication protocol is needed, like depending on the application. Finally, regulatory and standardization experts are important for the identification and definition of integrity requirements for different fraud applications. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, available again to answer. Thank you, Gianluca. So we arrived uh, at the end uh, of our webinar. Uh, there are indeed uh, some uh, other questions, so now we will answer them. By the way, I take the occasion to uh, tell you that these are our contacts so you can uh, contact us if you have additional questions on this uh, webinar. The slides uh, will be available on the Jupyter uh, website and we will send them to all the participants who applied for this to enroll to this webinar. The webinar, the MP4 uh, recording will be uploaded on the Jupyter website and on the uh, NAVSAS website, so www.navsas.eu, and you will be able to uh, re-listen re it again if, in case uh, you have uh, some doubts. So back to our questions. Um, does the software module use a dedicated transmitting receiver infrastructure to send the data to the central station? Or does it use the local mobile or other infrastructures? So, uh, for uh, in the frame of this project, the infrastructure was dedicated, but in principle, it is also possible to use local mobile. And uh, but the, the 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 project was the focus of the project was uh, on the use of EGNSS together with Bainet, that is the more more most efficient way to to uh, share this kind of information. And uh, there is a second question: uh, Can we say integrity for road requires collaborative receivers? Yes, in this case, uh, the collaboration between uh, users and their receivers was uh, fundamental because more are the receiver, more uh, is the information that can be shared, and so the the modelization of the uh, let's say RF environment and the, the, the behavior of multipath and, and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so more complicated than for aviation then? Definitely. Okay, so um, uh, I don't see any additional questions, but if in case you have some, you can always write us and uh, we will answer you by email. Uh, I really thank you all for uh, your patience to arrive at the end of this webinar. Uh, we will organize additional webinars in the next month before the end of the Jupiter project, so stay tuned. Bye.